think I sort of stumbled into the marine work backwards. I was finishing my dissertation. Um, there were conflicts arising at the University of Hawaii, specifically at that time over the GMO of color. So I was hired by the university to help them understand why they made all the wine so bad. It truly wasn't rocket science, but it did get me into work that focused on how science and community could better work together towards improving our ecosystems. Um, after I finished my PhD, I eventually went out on my own um, and started just doing community work, largely um, sanctuaries. My background was actually in law, also nonprofit organizations. So I, for many years, worked on behalf of the communities, and then I have been so fortunate to develop a great relationship with NOAA. I don't always have a great relationship with other federal agencies, but um, I really enjoyed working with NOAA. And through sort of my seat on the sanctuaries, and then relationships I already had with people on Maui, like Uncle Charlie Maxwell, I kind of stumbled into this position where now I work with monk seals and other marine mammals regarding sharing. Very short. I on there. Um, really important to me, my dad is a fisherman, actually a fisherman and a hunter, which always put me in a really interesting place in conservation. But being in a room with all these conservationists, and like, all those hunters, all those fishermen, and it was very hard because my dad's a fisherman. So I always felt um, a very, very deep pride in who my family was and a deep sense of the need to advocate for understanding that community better. Um, monk seal work in particular was very interesting. My father hates monk seals. Hates them. Um, I remember I used to write for the Honolulu Advertiser. And somehow one day monk seals came up. I was like, oh, mongoose, mongoose, I hate them. Rats, rats. And so I really felt particularly drawn to this issue with monk seals because I understood on both sides how incredibly passionate people were. Um, so, you know, a lot of why I do this is because I really want just both communities to get along and I want to see equal system improvements for everybody. So people like my son, you know, will have an environment where there are still species, they can see, he can still fish. My son loves to fish. And I will say, that's a very small appeal. It did get thrown back. <laughs> Their need to fish. 
that are concerned about the fisheries, to me, that is an ultimate expression of aloha for Hawaiians. It is just aloha aina. And it is, you know, and so a lot of what I do is I just at the beginning take a step back. That is Hawaii. This is, um, you know, Hawaiians, we have this, sort of we grew up with it. We, that's my son in my cousin's lucky fields in Monowilla Valley. That's me and Puyo on an ATV a few years. You can tell us a few years ago I was much skinnier then. Um, and, you know, we have this connection. So when issues come up, and when people stand up and, and they express concern or the family, it's because really we do have this relationship that, you know, really kind of consumes our lives um, and really is part of the history of Native Hawaiians. So, Aloha Aina is much, much more than a love for the land. Aloha Aina was also, and really with Kioni here, I should have him talk about the whole politics of the movement. Um, it was both environmental and political. Aloha Aina was really a, a patriotic cry for Hawaiians through most of our history. There was, it has very um, clear political roots to the monarchy era and the kingdom eras. It was a rallying cry of resistance. It was, it spoke to our relationship to the land. Um, I always like to explain Kama Aina versus Koa Aina, and it's how I was taught by a certain fishermen. Kama Aina, which a lot of people use today, meant child of the land. You could directly trace your lineage back to the land. Whereas Hoa Aina was a term for those who came here who were not necessarily Native Hawaiian descent, but became friends to the land. And I like to point that out because I like to remind people on both sides that we have this very long history of Hawaiians as advocates and protectors of the land, but also finding ways to work with those who may not be from here but showed a dedication and commitment to this place. And that is, this is a very important part of our history. So Hawaiians, and when we talk about the children of the land, I'm one of those people that really cares a lot about genealogy. And, and I can trace my roots back to Papa and Moke. I can go all the way back, as can every Hawaiian if they know their genealogy or not. So when we talk about the environment, these things that happen, it's not just these are resources, this is family to us. So, I like to give that history as a little bit of context, and sometimes where wines come from. And one of my favorite songs, and I think from you too, right? Is Wine Language Class. Can you come and sing it? He did? I remember. I'm not that senile. Um, this concept, you know, a lot of people say this as I am Hawaiian. I, I've always interpreted it as much more literal than that. It's not that I'm white, it's that I'm white. So, and these are just pictures. I like pictures. I like to, as the other kid house talked today, I really love to go around and enjoy places. And so I think that's, that was my birthday on the Hupulea with you. Right? Yes. Sorry, it's, I never get to have my friends in the room from other islands. So this is wonderful. This is Ta'ala. That's my male daddy. That's um, Hanale and Mokai. Um, okay, so this is <laughs> um, the eight seas. And I was taught that this was a poetic way to speak to the oceans that bound us, all the seas of Hawaii. That's my little son again, he's seen a lot. So the monk seals. You know, um, I like many didn't see a monk seal I was, you know, it wasn't like I saw one every day. Um, but kind of how I fell backwards into this was we have this Moxiel, KP2. And Uncle Walter Reddy, who kind of the Moloka picture, calls me up one day and says, Kihal, having this meeting at QOCC, it's about the seals. Come. <clears throat> and what sort of emerged was concerns between the fishermen and the conservationists over the recovery of the sea. Very quickly thereafter, this seal appeared in um, Kanaka Pai Park. And this was a very, very interesting seal. They eventually named him Ho'ailona, a sign. And in many ways it was, because Ho'ailona brought to light the emerging conflict between many people who, as they encountered monk seals, developed a great love for them, even in the Hawaiian community, and a part of the Hawaiian community that had a lot of resistance and questions about the role of the seal. 
Um, most of them really, well, the place, first place I ever saw seal actually was doing when I took these pictures was Ma'o Point. Um, a lot of us who spent time on Molokai, particularly fighting this development, um, really we encountered seals a lot. We developed our own relationships with them and developed really an interesting respect. But true enough, there wasn't a lot of information that we knew. It wasn't like people commonly talked about it. And then we had Poilona. And then you have Poilona and these children. Um, I actually have a song that the children sing about Poilona that I didn't bring tonight. But it's a beautiful song written by someone on Molokai where these people who kind of like many of the volunteer networks just developed a profound love for this animal. But, as any of you know, I'm not supposed to touch them. So there were a lot of questions and confusions and things that started to emerge that made it very clear that the community had to have a better dialogue about the historical significance of Moses. So, you know, I, I started to go around, I started to ask more, and we had things. We had Kupuna who would tell us about those things. We've had people including, in fact, Uncle Charlie Maxwell today, talk about how the monks here were on Mokua to certain people. We have people on Hawaii Island, we have people on Maui, we have people here and there. Um, and then we also had people like Reverend Pop um, Papu David Pu'upu, who would talk about, and that's where the title comes from, Nami Apulu, how on growing up on Molokai, he was taught that the monks here was referred to as Meapulu, the furry ones, because of their fur. So, we had a lot of questions, so we started to go back, and we're still in the process of doing this, but through the Hawaiian language newspapers. And we do see that even back in the mid-1800s, there were multiple places where people would refer to the animal in the newspapers, in various stories. Um, we do see the Iliopoli of Wawane. We see um, some references to Hulu Kai. We see Ilio Kai. We see different names. Um, we certainly know that after contact, there were numerous sightings in one language <coughs> newspapers, but for me, um, it was more interesting to see what was in the Hawaiian language newspapers prior to the overthrow. Um, we also see that there are multiple places throughout Hawaii that the names are linked through, and we look this up with Kui, the place in Hawaii, um, that are linked to the monk seal. So these are at least a few of them. Um, we're still in the process of reaching them, but who he does identify them with the monk seal. Um, what the other very interesting thing that has happened is we now have had the Robinsons come forward and provide very, very interesting and extensive commentary on the monk seals on the call. And they're just really, really interesting stories that he's coming with, and we're very grateful. Um, I think we're still in the process of building that relationship, but it's been wonderfully interesting to learn about and very, very valuable, at least for me, um, from both a recovery standpoint and a cultural standpoint. Okay. Um, this is yours, okay. So usually I just talk about them, but I'm on Maui, so I dragged them here tonight. Um, one of the most, I think one of the most rewarding things I've worked on is um, the there has been an effort, and we heard this a lot, and it was unfortunate that we couldn't talk about it more when we got around the islands, but we are all, I think all of us here, aware of the problems that Galapagos sharks have posed to the monk seals of the Northwestern Hawaiian Islands. Um, I actually sat on the Northwestern Hawaiian Cultural Advisory Council five years ago when Bud first came? Five or six years ago when the permit first came to us. Um, and maybe one or two years ago now, the permit came back. And there were a number of us who stepped up to say, okay, if you are going to take Mono, then you need to use them appropriately. So we were very, very lucky to get practitioners to get involved in this um, recovery effort, and they're here tonight. So can I drag you back? Okay. So, okay, and this is fair because the first book phone call was to Kyoni. So, this is Kyoni Kooha. Um, Kyoni and I know each other from the University of Hawaii. Do you want to just introduce yourself? And so, that's okay. Yes, <laughs> it's much more than that. Just leave what the UH did, but okay. <clears throat> well, 
Well, I guess what we're presenting tonight is a snapshot of a conversation that's still going on. It's not the end of a conversation, but we're not here to tell you the Hawaiian perspective on this. Uh, but we're just to give you a sense of, of where the conversation has been from, from the perspective of, of two Native Hawaiians and maybe a sense of, of where the conversation is going. So I, I've been on the, the Hawaiian Cultural Working Group for the Northwest Hawaiian Islands since I started voyaging up there. That was maybe seven, eight, nine years ago. And you know, they, there's this evolving sense at NOAA and at, at a lot of federal agencies that one way isn't the only way and that multiple perspectives need to be taken into consideration if we're going to build uh, an enduring sort of uh, plan and future for these places. So more recently, um, the permit came to us and there is a very, very lively debate within the working group about what we do, Mano, um, the, the monk seal, you know, we have, we have histories with them, we have um, various connections, some very familial, very close connections with, with these creatures. And so what do we, how do we go forward? How do we do this pono? And truthfully, the working group didn't have a, a single answer. We, we all had sort of different takes on it, and it would pretty much probably ran the gamut of, of perspectives from don't even think about touching the manual to, you know, why, why do we care about the manual? The shark, yeah. And in particular, uh, the local sharks. So in the, since there is sort of an absence of a decision, um, and the permit had gone through and, and was, uh, they have been given permission to, to collect or to, uh, I guess what they're calling, calling sharks. Um, I decided that I would help to make that a fruitful endeavor for Hawaiian, some Hawaiian practitioners, people that wanted to, um, to be a part of that. And so what we looked at, and Quail was uh, a critical part in, in looking at this and, and trying to understand the perspective of, of what we should do, what is the context of what we are doing, which was going up there to enable the capture of certain sharks, um, some very selective capture of sharks, and what happens after that. Um, maybe I should, uh, what is sharks? Uh, yes. Um, <laughs> so essentially, the basic premise is that uh, Many of our families, maybe not all our families, but many of our families have been collecting shark in various ways for, from the beginning of time. We're related to shark. We collect shark for various purposes. We know that uh, mano is a very uh, essential, uh, the variety of mano, very essential to our, has been to our lifestyle. You know, it, you, cannot, you cannot finish off a canoe without um, that sandpaper, which is uh, shark. You, you can't, your, your cutting tools, at least some of them, not all of them, are from the shark's teeth. Yeah, your um, tools that help you refine those meters that, that clothe us. So it, the shark is imbued in everything we do. Um, we have it as family members. My own family is, part of that family is a certain type of mano from a certain place. So we, we have these connections to them. And so we, Quail and his, his tradition looked at sharks in three different ways. You know, it's not, it's not as simple as saying, this is a shark, and we have the same relationship to all of them. Um, there, there are many more nuances to people that um, live with these things and, and, and for whom these things are a, a, a deep part of our families. And so we have one, we have mano, uh, manoipa, which is sort of the, the, the most common Mano, it's not a type of shark as far as we, we classify sharks nowadays, but it's it, it's a type of mano that was eaten, that was used for its its parts. Uh, we have mano kanaka, and mano kanaka are those sharks who may have been kanaka at one point, have, may have been human at one point, and went through a process of becoming shark to to encapsulate that, that mana in a, a family, family member that's going to continue to support the family in various ways. Um, and then we have mano kumupa, 
and those are the Kumpa Ami uh, solid foundation. And those are the sharks that are beyond any recognition or any memory. Those are the sharks that um, you find at the very beginning of time. Those sharks uh, often came to Hawaii from foreign lands or, or have always been here. And those are sharks that um, have such a status of Akua that they are beyond sort of our, our simple comprehension of what a shark is. Um, you know, I'm just going to pass it <laughs> And then at the end, we can have some question and answer, but it's either for the some of the spiritual shark. Is it that Akua? All sharks are spiritual. Yeah, to, to separate spiritual and, and physical and, and emotional, like, it's not as easy as to do Aloha, my name is Pueo. I live in Mapoao. Pueo means owl. I'm a mountain bird. So to travel to the Northwest Hawaiian Islands on a boat, it wasn't um, my favorite thing to do. Um, but it was for a good cause. Uh, I am Kumukuli here. Um, I was born in California. Um, but of course, my Hawaiian genealogy stems from Maui as well as Kauai. Luhuhane. And then a name that I'll mention, um, one of my ancestors, uh, five generations back, his name was Lonoa Kea'ala. And one of the reasons why I felt, okay, when we were asked to do this, this particular project, they said, we already have the permits, we're going to kill the sharks, we're going to call the sharks. Um, so, how can, we, how, how can we benefit from this? Um, and as Tony mentioned, we do have uses for every part of the shark. From the meat, to the teeth, to the skin. Um, and of course, for black, or selling the black market to the Chinese. I'm just kidding. <laughs> um, but one of the names in, in the Kumu Honua tradition is for the monk seal is Ilio Holoi Kagwawa Alono. And so, knowing that one of my Kukuna's name was Lono Akiyama, I had no problem with this. Knowing that um, every natural resource, natural phenomenon in our environment is a kinolau or a body form of one of our Akua. And knowing that 100% of Hawaiians um, can trace genealogy back to a me, which means that we can trace our genealogy back to these Akua. <coughs> we now know that if these, everything in a natural environment is a body form of one of these Akua, I have a genealogical tie to these Akua. We also know that um, for those who follow the Pumulipo genealogy, if it was existed in the ocean, it had a counterpart on the land. Um, and even um, if it had a ferocious nature, it had a, a counterpart that had a more uh, waipahe or uh, docile nature. So looking at those kinds of things, and knowing that in this particular area, in, at French Frigate Shoals, um, that these sharks were able to come in and kill the baby monk seals because humans dredged through the um, coral reefs. Um, that was another reason. Also knowing that in our stories um, of, I think, Aukele and, and other things, that seals were mentioned in the form of ilio. Well, when the Hawaiian ilio, or the Polynesian ilio went extinct, maybe that's also when the seaside counterpart started to suffer. And there is no shortage of Galapagos sharks. And there, they had targeted a few of these sharks. So why don't we then um, take it upon ourselves to say, OK, they don't have a limit. But did they have a limit? 20. 20. But why don't I put faith in something else to provide that limit? And so as he mentioned, that um, that those three kinds of sharks, the kumupa'a, the manokanaka, and the manoi'a, that's, that's very well known. I'm pretty sure most people know about those uh, segments. 
and we pretty much know that you will never ever see or be able to harm a non kumu pa'a. Again, that's like kumu wali, kuhei muana. These are entities that are so large that are, are beyond our comprehension. Or we just come them. And then the mano kamaka, that were transfigured into sharks. Human spirits that were transfigured into sharks. We're pretty sure that we're not going to be able to catch somebody else's omokua. And the whole pen for that, or the, the outcome of that, is usually pretty dire. And it's pretty immediate <coughs> if you harm your own omokua or you harm someone else's omokua. There's the Lahaina story of the, the omokua coming up to the beach and the little boy just thought it was a shark and poked him in the eye. And then he himself went immediately blind. And that's the story that's still, and that's, this was like in the maybe 30s or 40s. So we were pretty sure that when we do our prayers and we ask these kumupapapa for a manoika, a fish that we might be able to harvest, and then we dedicate in those prayers, and they're very, very lengthy, but the things that we have to do, I can go over that later if you'd like. Same. All of this is going to be used. Please give to us that which um, you think we are deserving of, based on the offerings that we're bringing and that exchange of manna. You know, you can't just expect something without giving something. So we were able to, they were able to harvest the shark for us. And everybody who donated things like the, um, the whole avocado or the sugar canes, or the, the different fish that we had to take up there, or whatever it was, they all get a portion of this particular manol. From the teeth to the skin. Um, there is an uncle that does want the meat that, that's connected to the skin, but uh, he can have it. <laughs> it is a little scary. So, we, what we end up doing was um, taking this situation and saying, the shark is either just going to end up in a freezer for research and then dispose of Or the shark can be, um, we can go ask for a shark and let these people do the work for us. And then we, we can bring it back to the community. And that was the, the decision that we, we decided to support. Um, as Tony mentioned, there were fireworks at those meetings. I don't, I don't want to mention names, um, but some of the kupuna were either dead set against it or fully supportive of it. And then it was almost a brawl about when no announced that this was going to happen. So we, during this whole process it took us, it took us about a month and a half just to prepare for the ceremony. It, we felt that, that pressure. But I have no problems knowing that. I, took mana from a different area, put it somewhere else, and then it's brought back. We say, what well, the people? The circle returns to where it began to. We feel that. And again, if it wasn't for human involvement, and the humans, not, it doesn't matter what race they are, dredging that particular area, they allow those sharks to come in. And, you know, the videos speak for themselves. Um, and just being in, in those waters, if you've never been up there, it's, you just have to put your foot in the water because those ulua are huge. huge like this screen. <laughs> so, yeah. Uh, any questions as far as those things are concerned or comments? Let me talk about the I just like to ask a question. <coughs> Is the break in the are so out of balance now that the, um, uh, I know that, that, that particularly the pops are declining like that. I don't, so maybe, okay, David Stolfo, I'll give you a wonderful segue to you. Um, and then let me, I'll respond to that. I don't believe so. I believe it has to do with a variety of factors that are impacting that ecosystem there, including the apex predator environment and various things. So I don't think the break in the reef is the lone factor. I believe we have it's a multiplicity. It's a multiplicity of factors. And it's incredibly complicated factors. But I want to because I know there are a bunch of fishermen here. So I know when we come, you know, and we couldn't, like I said, with the PEIS, my job was just to sit here and all closed and moderate and your phone is off. But there were many questions 
that came up, why aren't you guys fishing out in the Northwest and Why aren't you fishing out the jacks? Why aren't you fishing out the sharks? I, I wanted Koyo and Kyoni to be here tonight to know that we are. We were the Hawaiians, like Kyoni and Koyo said. It was not easy. There were Hawaiians who said, don't you dare touch the sharks up there. And it took a lot. We, I mean, it's been like a five, I mean, at least for Kyoni and I, it's been a five year conversation. We, we, we were, look, somebody said to us, one of the main people said, I mean, come on, how many months of do we really want? And that was that's, that was the total opposition to what where we want to preserve based on what the damage that we're supporting. Now. And and that it was not easy. So so part of it was, and, and I want people to understand, when we come and advocate in the main Hawaiian Islands, we don't do so lightly. It's because we took the heat and the fight and, and we're willing to take the steps we needed to do for the northwestern Hawaiian Islands where I feel comfortable here, and I, and I want the fishermen to know that. We're the front line of people who get screamed at, the people who want to protect the sharks, and, you know, I have a son who loves to fish. Five years ago, I don't know if you remember this, and I might get teary-eyed. When we had to make the decision to support it, everybody said, you have to think about what's going to happen when our children go in the water. If you okay killing sharks, you think about that, and I do. I, as a mother whose son lives in the water, it was a very, very hard, deep spiritual decision to make. But I know for me, I could not justify the things we do down here if I was not also advocating to take the steps we needed up there, because that's not fair to the fish right here. So, I, and, and the story was really not mine to tell. I'm so endlessly grateful for having friends who are way more awesome than I probably deserve. But I wanted that said, and I wanted you to folks to hear from them. And it's a bunch of people. Okay, come on, say. Um, Tristan, I want to bring you Tristan too, who is a researcher helping, and Kehau Kimukeo, who's from Kiana. So no, many Maui people. Oh, wait, I saw a question first. Yeah, you know, the, the imbalance, I think, is, is, is relatively um, common sense. I think there's, it, the population of Maui is zero. There's no humans out there. Yeah. And you're going to repropagate in an overcrowded lot. This, this state is, we choke, look at this room. We can't even feel, uh, you know, have spare chairs for some common, you know, discuss commonalities. It is too much, too far to, to try and really subdue these, these species back. Look at the mainland, cougars, wolves. It's so far, the sprawl is so far into the wilderness, they're not taking the wolves and cougars and taking them way out farther than they should be, bears. That's the same thing you're doing with this. And I'm looking at the spirituality of this. You're looking at this, you know what I'm going to fight? It's because the door you guys were open with these uh, uh, Amakuas. That's what they're concerned about. The door is shut. Do not open it. Call the help us down our families. Okay already. You guys will bring them back. All the new generation will be popular. And I think that's what's hard. You that's know? hard. Well, I mean, for, so for everyone who feels like you, we have Kupuna who also say, please save them. Please save them. So, so it's hard because we are the ones in the middle of this conversation. And I think we take, so no, we take that seriously. I mean, you're not unlike my father. He's like, what are you doing? What are you opening? <coughs> but at the same time, I don't want it on me to see a species go extinct. You know, because we know that what's happening is because of what we've done to the Northwest of Hawaiian Islands. That's why I'm saying, and, and I truly believe, translocation is the last resort. Because that's the issue for everybody, right? They don't want them down here. But are you telling me as fishermen, you guys don't fish sharks or ulua? Or I mean, right? I mean, people people fish for animals all the time, you know. So that's that's a hard conversation, but it is, you know. I mean, there are not. I mean, has anybody here not fished or hunted? I mean, that's a hard conversation, but it's a dialogue we have to have. So yes. Are we talking about long seals or are we talking about sharks? But we're talking about both, right? So we need to get back on focus only because you have to remember that all the fishermen that were fishing up there, they got paid to move out. And that, that's a big thing up there. They got paid to move out. When they moved out, everything, all the habit happened, okay? So the balance wasn't there. That's why the sharks started moving in. So there's, there's a lot of history within this that needs to be told. Um, because I see this focusing more on the mano 
than a seal. And, and I came here to visit the Mount Seal. I understand all of the history because everybody here is not Hawaiian. Um, but we need to get back on track to the purpose of why we're here. Well, and I guess that's part of it, is when I have gone and talked to people, people will say, why aren't you taking care of the sharks if you love us and why not? So that's the number one question I get. So I feel like it is important to give part of that to understand all of these things are interconnected. You can't talk about the monk seal without talking about the sharks, without talking about the whales. I mean, it is our nature to understand that all of this system is interconnected. So I think when we talk about it, it's a direct response to a lot of the questions we've gotten. So if you want more information, I can send you the primary Hawaiian language documents because those we have them. You know, so I think if you have give a specific question other than no, because I know all that history. I just want to know what what you folks are bringing the people together for. I mean, when is this 300 pups occurring? When are they coming? I don't know where you get 300 pups from. Well, this is the whole thing from the beginning. It started off they were going to transport 300 seals within the Hawaiian Islands. Um, so this is this was our concern. Okay, then I'm here. To, that's inaccurate. I mean, there's never been, nor has there ever been, nor will there ever be, any proposal to bring 300 on seals out. That's just false. So next. Yeah, I'm going to ask for the oil and the other the representative on the deck to want to or the animal for a I just came back one month of strange legislative bills. <laughs> in the House and the Senate. And we've been having a hard time trying to educate our legislators. I think tonight what I'm here for is to understand uh, the, I, I'm not gonna point fingers to Noah, but at the present time I cannot congratulate Noah for the big mess up with the state for dumping all that junk outside the recent briefs at the latest meeting we had in Kihei. They destroyed all the reefs and walked away with not saying a darn word under the governors in the lingo and our team's administration. So Kihei came on forward. What I mean, sister, is not to look or listen to your. I admire the Hawaiiana. We fought hard to bring Hawaiiana and language to University of Kumanalea. I, I admire the history of Naumako. I have been to the Northwestern Hawaiian Islands. We have been part of the Kukuna, but I'm so glad I see you as part of the Magnuson Act that I'm in charge to kill all the monitors, the young men and women, so we're trying to find out what is your purpose here. Is your purpose here to talk about the nonsense? No. Or is your purpose is to come here to prophesy all oh, literature prior to the conquest of Kamehameha in our own lives? They go further back before the conquest of Baal, before the time of the old Moku systems that every island had control of. You come here to talk about one size shoes or socks to wear in our own language. Forgive me, I congratulate for the doctorate degree in the state of Hawaii that you folks are for. I'm proud, however, I feel very strained here to listen about the issue of what, what has these monks you got to do. And what are the issues? Three weeks ago, I just sat with the Hawaiian city clubs, sitting down with key provinces, who is not Hunahiki, after the death of Benamina, who died, who was part of our legislator representative, with Keith Robinson, whose brother with the 25 board of trustees of the Robinson Crusoe family, who controls the island of Nihon, I made so many deals with the military of oh, Eno. But the bottom line is, please bear with me. This is important for education for all of us tonight. 
with Keith Robinson made an agreement with somebody at the higher levels of federal Uka Uka top story. Because Keith Robinson is <coughs> part of his interest is with the Lao Lapao Endangered Species Garden on Kauai. He comes in and he tells me he has already implemented a build and permitting process in front of me being the Aha Kioi representative by law to begin to spawn seals on the island of Kaolave. <clears throat> now wait a minute. And I said, what did you say? No, we're going to start the spawning of seals on the island of Kauai. Who gave you that permission? Did the Kauai Island Reserve give you that permission? No. Did the County of Maui give you that permission? No. Did the Protect Kauai Ohana give you that permission to see some permission? No. Did the DRNR give you that permission? <coughs> he coughed. He coughed, a loud cough. <coughs> Did OHA give you that permission? No. So, those of you with OHA background, we're up front now, young man and woman. You're up front to see the reason why I'm here. I'm here to find out who gave, beside you, sister. Was you the one that gave the signature? Well, wait, wait, wait. Okay. You and more. With all these bars here, from Mokumana Mana, and now, reverse, to Nihau, and now, Nagika, Kawaii, and now, reverse, yes, to Makaha. Anau kaika, namano o kuloro ika. Do you know where kuloro ika is? You folks are all Hawaiian language. Do you folks know where kuloro ika is? Oh, yeah. Where? 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 In Manoa? Kuloro ika. Mahalo, Murilo. The sea of kuloro ika. Yeah? It's the original name of Honolulu Harbor. Do you know what was that Kulo here? What? Fish ponds. The fish ponds of Kulolo here. And what else? In Ko, like where the oldest of Honolulu, Ko. Right? Because it had. Not Ko, I only think, Ko was the chiefest. Malama, Mamala was the chiefest. Kulolo here was Kekai or Kulolo here. Prior to Pa'au's time. Prior to Pa'au's time, and let me explain you this, I'm here to know about the seal. What has legislating or permit processing is going on without our mobile systems, our people, our 43 mobiles in our thing. What are we going through this seal when we're talking about the Mano? I am against you talking about the Mano. I am against you talking about things that we set on aside. We do not, our families do not even give the name of our mano or the character or the place or the story of our mano or Kahaolabe or from Maui. I, I despise you guys for doing that. I despise when you first talk about the mano that we're struggling to keep the secrets of our moko, our secret places, our birthday of the mano. So why come over here and talk about the mano? When I'm here to talk respond. about the seal, how and how, but that is, give me an answer tonight. How come the study on seal birthday place, according to Keith Robinson, who will not prove that by Noah? I heard it was Noah. Okay, Keith Robinson is incorrect, period. Um, that is totally inconsistent with everything we've been told. Well, Hold on, let me finish now. That is incorrect. There is no birthing place on Ho'olabe for monk seals. 
Keith Robinson spoke to us in fact last week. So I believe there is some confusion, and I am more than happy to have that conversation with Keith. So there is this information. I have it with the Kaurabi Army Reserve Commission. And I have also talked to them. I meet with them on the 28th. I have. I've talked to them. Thank Kauravi. you. So that, there is confusion. Let me respond. I am not just a PhD. I am the Ahamoku chair for my island. I was at the last Kubalu. I am the one writing the reports for Kona because nobody else stepped up from my Moku. I am working with everybody on my island. I don't come here just because I have Palo Palo. I put in the work in my community. I sit on the board of my civic club. So know that there is misinformation, and I'm happy to address that, but there is misinformation. There is no popping site on Palo Palo. Um, I want to address, I think, a very important um, element. It's fundamental, and I think you know this will help all of us kind of put things into context. When you talk about Mano, you talk about the seals, you talk about any part of our Aino or Moana, um, it's very important that we never ever let go, never forget one of the most important part of ourselves, and that's our humility. And what I'm referring to is that in the ocean, whether you mono, whether you sink, um, um, monk seal, whether you want fish, that environment belongs to the people of the sea. Our ancestors of the sea. Now, we humans, we live on land. And so, on land is where we're compatible with. The fish cannot come out of the land and, and, and dominate or manipulate you know, the people of the land. In the same respect, we of the land, it's physically impossible to go to the realm of the sea and be dominant or superior. And so when we're addressing concerns and issues of the sea, be it Mano or the seals, we need to understand if a human being goes into the ocean and decides to take it on with a shark, who do you think will win? I mean, that's, that's basic, and I, I don't mean to be rhetorical um, you know, about it, but my, my point, Trish, is that I understand the work that you guys are doing and the intent and the purpose. I commend you. Yet, there is a very important aspect of what Uncle Les is talking about. And I'm sure you will get to the bottom of any potential misunderstandings. But what he's saying is very important. What he's talking about is about fundamental principles that allow us human beings to reach the point that we're at today. Without those fundamental principles, we would have all been extinct many, many years ago. And I truly believe that. And so, in today's society, we have technology. You know, we're, we're moving, we moved out of the industrial age into the data age, and now we're going into the Ethernet age. Okay? We cannot lose sight, or we cannot let go of that fundamental humanity within us. So when we address and we have conversations about the people of the sea, we need to understand and never forget that that's their realm. That's their, they are, they're the top dogs, not the human beings. And so we need to just rein in our arrogance. And now, you're, you know, we want to save the, the, the monk seals. We want to address, you know, the issues of, uh, of whatever, you know, concerns we have with the sharks, with Mano. But everything that we're talking about is all created by human beings. So in the process of finding the remedy, let's not create more problems because it starts with the human beings. That's why there's all these problems, period. And so, you know, I don't want I don't want us to just get distracted in the conversation. And and, and he's right, you know, there's an ancient protocol, there's an ancient principle that we need to adhere to, and that is, you know, one moku do not go to another moku and mahoi. We need that protocol, we need that respect, and we can keep it when we have that humility. And that's all I want to say.
this little topic. It's funny, it doesn't surprise me that the scoping summary report was done in Alaska. Yeah? But a lot of information that came out of um, that, that scoping period because of the programmatic environmental impact statement when they were going around and asking people for Manao. A lot of my Manao is inside here and the information that is provided in this outweighs 